And the next speaker in our dynamic program will be Professor Stefan Jansson from Umeå Plant Science Center that will talk about the CRISPR cabbage story. Yeah? Right. Please go ahead. Thank you. And uh, so I will spend a few more words on something else because, I mean, this is, I think the reason why I was asked to come here and uh, also sit in the Scientific Advisory Board was partly that I've been much involved in what I will talk about now, which is this regulation. I mean, how should, will we really be allowed to use the no novel breeding tools and so on in Europe and elsewhere? But I do also have some scientific background in similar areas because we're working with trees, with forest trees, which are basically totally undomesticated. And that's why we are involved in, we are not breeders and we are not domesticating them, but we're trying to get the tools for tree breeders to use in the future as well. I will come back a little bit to that at the end because there, there are, uh, of course, big challenges, but there are also enormous opportunities since there is no uh, basically non-domesticated. The most advanced tree genetics, forest tree genetics programs are probably in the third generation now. So there is uh, much to gain in the future. But anyway, I will start by talking about Gina did it, cabbage. And so, the, I mean, I have, and maybe some of you also have over the years been discussed much about whether we are, should be allowed to use genetically modified plants more in, in agriculture and uh, forestry and whatever. This is some of the things that I've been doing, so sort of writing debate articles, being in TV discussions. We wrote a book a couple of years ago from the Swedish Academy of Sciences. So I think we have tried our best, but frankly, the success have been not so <laughs> immense. There are, there, the public opinion is, I would say, it's slowly shifting, but it goes very, very slow. And this is something that makes us frustrated. So, and of course, it is frustrating because we, I mean, there is a historic precedence of this where political decisions was really corrupting plant science back from the Soviet days back, back in the 30s where this guy Trofim Lysenko, who was, you know, the, basically the one that started to use vernalization, he got promoted by Stalin and his friends because they saw the political point of this. They say, because they started doing parallel science. They were saying that some of the genetic, that was bourgeois science, that pro in real proletarian science, we are not so much de determined by our genes. It's actually that society can change us. And in that respect, they could publish that body can turn into rye with the right treatment, which was as an argument for that the socialist society could make people better. If we just treat them better, they will be inherently better. And that's why this got so big resonance in this. And it, if I got it right, it actually destroyed Russian or Soviet plant science for decades because these people got the funding and they were sitting in the academies and deciding about uh, research projects and so on. And of course, we don't want to get into this again, that stupid political decision is blocking development. So, oh, so that's why when CRISPR was uh, invented now some seven years ago, and of course I always need to show this because in Umeå we are so proud that Emmanuel Charpentier was working there when this happened. So we feel this is almost our, our invention. But anyway, so of course, as a scientist, I realized this was a good tool that we can use in basic science, but at least as important, I thought that there is this other aspect that, uh, as you understand, this may have the potential to change the whole GMA debate, GMO debate into something different. So that's why I spent quite some energy on trying to use that opportunity also, not just use the opportunities of this in science. And yeah, this causes breeders, you know this, all these techniques that are here in green, they are regarded as non-GMO techniques, and which means that the products of these plants can be grown by anyone, anywhere, without basically any regulation. And the red ones in, which are the effect, I mean, the results of transformations are basically 
not available for farmers un unless they are very strict and almost impossible uh, restrictions to go through before you get these ones commercial. So that's the background. So, right, already back in 2013, I started to think, okay, if we should do something, what, what should be the first CRISPR edited plant that should be produced from our side? And which is the, f the first one where we can go to the authorities and ask, okay, if we do it just like this, and in particular, if we only make a deletion somewhere, not adding any DNA anywhere, which is the plant that we should ask the authorities whether this is uh, allowed as a non-GMO or not. And I've been involved in this GMO field experiment applications for many years in Sweden, so I know sort of the procedure here. One thing that I realized immediately was that I mean, there were well, in other countries, people were asking questions to the authorities, what will, how will you handle this? They uh, rarely get, got any answers. So, but I knew that if we submit the concrete case and say, this particular plant, is this a GMO, yes or no? Then they have to say yes or no, because other, if you say, if you make a CRISPR deletion, it may, may say, well, it depends. If you do it in this way, maybe it's, uh, and so on. But on a concrete question, there must be a yes or a no answer. So the question was, what should be the concrete question? What should be the first plant to start with? And then I just realized that I have the, in what was, in my opinion, the perfect case right bef uh, before our eyes. Because I was involved back in 2000 to identify the PSBS protein as a key protein in photoprotection or in regulation of photosynthesis. This was in the old days before the Arabidopsis genome was sequenced. So the way that we got to these ones, these were mutants that were screened by flu uh, fluorescence, which you can do in a non-destructive way, which is very efficient. So there was first one deletion mutant, or uh, fast nutrient mutants that were isolated. That was actually back in 1996 in, in Berkeley. And then they, uh, since it took years and years to get to the point of this gene because we didn't have a genome sequence. In the meantime, they kept on screening EMS mutations. So by the time that we, after three years later, realized that it was the PSBS gene that was the cause of the mutation, and we could show that there was a deletion around this gene in, in the mutant. There was also EMS mutants that had been generated, and they had exactly the same phenotype, and they were sequenced, so we know that they sort of found the critical amino acids here in the protein. But that meant that we had uh, fast um, deletion mutants from radiation and EMS point mutations by an EMS in our hands since uh, 15 years. And of course, over the years, we had uh, fished out, knocked out, TNA knocked out mutants for these ones. And I've used this in my presentations for many years and say, hey, we have TDNA knockouts, we have EMS mutants, and we have uh, the, uh, radiation mutants. And if we, if we want to publish an EMS mutant in a good journal, they, the, the reviewers will ask us, you need to complement it, or you need to uh, prove it with a knockout, because otherwise we know it's, there are hundreds of other mutations that is, so we cannot prove that it's because of this mutation. So for us in science, we know that the transgenic approach is scientifically safe because we know what we're doing and the other is not safe. And in regulation, it's the other way around. So uh, this has been my favorite argument. But I should also say that this, once we had these mutants uh, isolated, we were a bit astonished at that time that it didn't show any growth phenotype in the lab because we thought this was an important protein. That's why we, two years later, did field experiments with these ones and showed that although we didn't see a phenotype in the lab, we could, if we grew them in the field, we saw a phenotype, so they produced fewer seeds and we basically put them back into the lab under variable light and showed that it was a variation in light that was the cause of this. And this was also good because what we can say here, if we knock this PSPS gene out, you're starting with a lousy plant and you make it even more lousy. <laughs> because we have shown that the Darwinian fitness of PSPS-less mutants were lower under field conditions. So no one 
would ever question that if you would start making a PSBS mutant, first of all, that this was a purely academic project. Secondly, that these plants could have been generated anyway. And thirdly, if they will be generated, they will not take over the world. And fourth, this is not a commercial project. No one would like to commercialize a PSBS less plant, probably because there, there is no growth benefit. That's also good from the communication point of view in this GMO debate where the sort of the big narrative is that there's a big companies against the small farmers and citizens and so, so you need to get away from this uh, commercial connection. So that's why we set out to try to recreate this PSPS mutants in Arabidopsis using CRISPR. So we thought we did two single guide RNAs and we, the good thing here is that we can by uh, non-destructive screening with, you can see whether we got PSPS missing because we know that they lack this particular fluorescence characteristics. So this is false color image if they look just the same, but you can distinguish with. And it's quite good also because you can get the spatial resolution. So if you, we also had a scientific thought behind this, that it would be good to have a tool to see where the CRISPR has worked in a non-destructive way, and that also would have spatial resolution. So you would see if it would only be half of the leaf where you have knocked CRISPR out or not. So, and it worked well in Arabidopsis. We later went into populus as well, because as I said, we are working with trees. We showed it actually exactly the same thing that we can do two single guide RNA so we can make a deletion and we see a phenotype that we can measure like that and the plants were happily growing. Which we think, so now when, we, when we're now trying to develop this, develop CRISPR in spruce, this is sort of this main technique we will use when we hopefully will get some mutants in the future as well, because here we will have real problems with mosaicism so and so on in, because we cannot, I mean, there are problems in transforming spruce in general. So we will not expect that we will get a wholly homogeneous plant, but here we can analyze it even if it will only be one branch that will be PSPS CRISPR and not the other. So, but then this is what we are all have to deal with when it comes to the GMO. This is the European definition of what is a GMO, and some of you have seen this before. Genetic material should be altered in a way that it does not occur naturally. And there are, you need to involve recombinant DNA uh, technique, or nucleic acid techniques and so on. And this is what the authorities have to relate to. So if we ask them in this, in this case, if we, which we did, yeah, we said, if we make, we know these ones are not GMOs, we know this is a GMO, if we remake the deletion with CRISPR, will it fall into either of the cat categories? Because it cannot ha be half GMO. It must be either a GMO or not a GMO. The deletion that we have in the radiation, it's actually bigger. There's also the, the nearby genes, I think it's a 16 KD deletion or so. So which we didn't know whether we can find that with two CRISPR. So that's why we made a, just a small deletion in one of the exons there. And uh, so it's not really the copy of this, but it, we're saying it's a more specific copy. And when, even before we started to do this, we should say <laughs> experimentally, we sent the letter to the authorities and said, if we do this, can we, will we be able to grow it? And they, I think this, well, to me, I knew, knew this will take time, <laughs> and I knew there would come questions from them. So that's why we did this as soon as possible. We had the idea and didn't give them any information. And of course, then they asked us, how will you do it? And in the meantime, we were developing this and finding which, which, is, which is a cloning system and so on. So we could answer the questions on the way. And to our delight, a year and a half later, we got the decision from our competent authority say, okay, if you do it in this way, if you're taking, we ask for two single guide RNAs, we look at it afterward, we can by sequencing find that there is no uh, transgenic DNA left, then it is not the GMO. And if it's not the GMO, 
you don't even have to ask us whether, it, <laughs> whether you want to do a field experiment. So that was the key thing here. Not the GMO, no, in, no information is needed whatsoever. And this was, in fact, the very first Arabidopsis plant we have. And of course, you know that typically the way that you do this is that first you insert tDNA with, with Cas9 and a single guide RNA. So this is transgenic. The point is that the offspring of this, not the, of it, this, will be transgenic. So when we did all this, we didn't have Arabidopsis that was transgene-free yet. Some of you probably used tried this as well in Arabidopsis, and you know, Arabidopsis is very hard to get this. I mean, the, if you're working with the 35S promoter, you don't get it expressed very high in the germ line, and that's what we did because this was sort of one of the first ones. So we really got the permit for a plant that we did, yet didn't have. <laughs> Just to say that we hope that we will get it in the future. But still there was, uh, they wrote about it and so in nature, because this was the very first competent authority in the world that made a decision about this. Half a year later, then the US came and now in other parts they did similar things. But that meant that that, that came in late 2015, that in the summer of 2016, it was really only in Sweden we knew that if we do this, we can grow them without the permit. It was coming, as I said, late in the spring of 2016 in the US, but I was actually thinking maybe no one is really prepared for doing it there. So I didn't know whether someone was doing it in 2016. But yeah, sure, we, we prepared because we knew it would come. So we had a lot of information material out there that we can say that this is how we did it. So this was, we can get everything out when the decision came. And right at that time, I was asked to give a TED talk, TEDx talk in Ubio about, and then I choose to talk about this because I think it was a nice story, and then I actually showed, well, here you have some seeds, and we, here in Sweden, we are the only ones where, place where we can grow this this summer, and I would do it. And, but the seeds that are shown there, if you have worked with Arabidopsis, you know that that is not Arabidopsis seeds because you can't <laughs> see them. And there were two reasons for this. First of all, we still haven't segregated out the Cas9. But the other reason was that Arabidopsis is, as you know, a pretty boring plant. I was thinking that it would be much more fun if we can do something that you can eat. <laughs> and so then I contacted some people in my network, and then I was able to get some cabbage seeds here from a line where a piece of DNA has been deleted, and they are segre segregated out the tDNA. And so far, I never told in public where I got this from and which gene that has been deleted because I thought I should do it, but then those people said, no, they were worried in their country that they will be negative responses. But it turned out to be a very nice story because then I could safely say also, if I don't tell you which gene has been deleted, you cannot find out. The only way, if you sequenced the plant right before you did the CRISPR, and after. And in this case, it wasn't done. This was just a lab strain that happened to do. But of course, this I didn't say here, so I'm sure I gave the impression that now we're gonna grow the Arabidopsis this summer. But then instead, I took in my house outside Umeå in the backyard. I was do, growing this cabbage seed in small organic pots and so on, and tried to do them as sort of, how, how should I say? non-professional response, or how would a gardener do if you would get a new variety of a plant if it wasn't in a lab or so? Yeah, well, you would just try to get it to germinate, put it out, hope that insects don't eat it, and then at one point you will eat it instead because you want to know how it tasted. I was carefully making sure that not to take a bite over the summer because the intention, I already talked to this guy who is a journalist, and hey, gave him an offer, do you want to share what maybe would be the first CRISPR meal in history. And he was, uh, yeah, yeah, he couldn't refuse. <laughs> so that's why we were sitting there in the balcony of my house and eating this, and I was making it together with pasta and so on. And I asked him because he's working at the sci radio, science radio in Sweden, but also since his main occupation is working in the gardening program, 
it was much more fun to have the gardening program to have sort of the scoop of this, where normally there are these ladies that are digging in soil and so on. And so that's where they reported it there in September 2016. Oh. There. And at the same time, I've been doing some writing over the summer, so then I was publishing this as a blog entry with this and even the recipe, because we thought if this was maybe a historical event, maybe it would be good to have the recipe published. And at that time, of course, we said this was maybe the first gene edited, because so we really thought that maybe someone would stand up and say, yeah, we did this. <laughs> We've been growing this, uh, this US mushrooms, for instance, that's been around for a year or so and eating them. But the, the reporter from science, he tried hard to find someone that actually had done a meal before. And so far, I haven't heard anyone, so that was probably, or I'm quite convinced, this was the first CRISPR meal. And there were a lot of reactions of this. I often say this was my 15 minutes of fame. So after a couple of months, I collected 300 citations throughout the world in some 40 countries where they've been writing about this. And the important thing from my point of view that out of these 300, only three were negative. This is this French anti-GMO site, so they wrote about it. They were clearly angry, but the good thing for me was that they didn't know who to be angry with. <laughs> they didn't know whether they should be angry with the authorities <laughs> or with the me or whether with the biology and so. so so the fact that 99% of them were sort of neutral or uh, positive, they just a reflection of that we've prob been able to find an example which was very hard to find argument against. And those that didn't like this, they simply ignored it. So that's why I think, uh, I mean, I, this has been a very positive story and people thought this was very fine and the others they tried to not mention it mention it at all. So, and there have been quite a lot of follow-up meals. This was an Australian TV team that actually wanted to stop by in Stockholm because they were on the way from South Korea where they interviewed, yeah, did some CRISPR banana stuff and they were going to George Church to talk about mammals. But then they wanted me to cook a meal. For some reason they didn't they want another, they wanted to have reindeer involved, so then I need to make another recipe with reindeer and <laughs> being on berries and so, <laughs> that, that they did in this. It's actually a very good documentary if you haven't seen it. They were intended to make it, on, get it on the US TV, but never made it, so but they found on, on uh, YouTube. So that was in December. We had, my family heard about that, so they wanted something for the Christmas, so then this was our Christmas dinner, and then I made some cabbage for them as well to <laughs> see. And right after Christmas, I was visited by a Dutch TV team. They were also doing a documentary about genome editing. And they wanted to come up and be at the site where we did it. So they came, three people, and spent two days in Umeå and rented the house right next to it. Maybe I should show this because the same week as we did this, we did here, we bought this other house over there, so now we are <laughs> renovated that and uh, renting this out. So this, so then this Dutch TV team, they were the first people that rented this. So then they were there and they were making, we were cooking a similar meal again. Then we've been growing the uh, cabbage in the, uh, I mean in the greenhouse, in the university, we can't grow them in January. But the funny thing why I mentioned this here was that right when we were doing this casting, so they spent the first night and then the next morning, I happened to find, which is then reported here in real life, there was an article in the New York Times saying this was the first meal with genome edited plants in history. So I was really disappointed that Dan Reuters wouldn't come here because this was this company which <laughs> he is affiliated to, that has claimed that they did the first meal here. This is the first dinner on earth with gene-edited food. So I thought it was quite fun. So both me and the 
information officer of the university wrote to the journalist and said, hey, did you miss something here? And he was really embarrassed and <laughs> said, yeah, yeah, I just believe the company and so on. So, but uh, to, I was really asked to go and do this many places and it became a bit inconvenient to carry the cabbage all the time. So then we had a cooking competition at the center. I said, can anyone make something that is more easy to handle? So this was the winning recipe where they fried leaves of cabbage with sesame seeds and olive oil. So then we've been doing this on batch. Then I have these little bags with chips that I can use in presentations and so on. And um, now I can't give it to you because then it, now it's GMO, so then that would be market release. But I was doing that quite extensively in Virginia. We have a fasc fascination of plant days. You may know this is a public event every second year. So those that came to uh, our booth in Umeå, they could buy a bag of these ones if they donated 10 crowns to Doctors Without Borders and so on. And they were, even the whistles, this politicians week every year where all the Swedish politicians gather in uh, the highland of Gotland and meet and then there were some meal there that they also got something there. So it was useful as a, as a marketing tool. It was. At the, that time I was also asked to go to the food tech meeting in Sweden. This is a completely different audience for me. So these were people that are inviting, are inventing new methods for taking care of food waste and so on. And I was talking about genome editing. But the, this was interesting, but the most important part of this, that, that gave me kind of an in, inlet to the foodie community. And one of the guys that invited me here introduced me to this Swedish master chefs, Gustav Trägård and Ulf Wagner, that had a, they have a Michelin star restaurant in Gothenburg. And that summer I was organizing a meeting in Gothenburg about CRISPR in, um, in plant breeding and plant science. So after quite some persuasion, we were able to get them to serve us a conference dinner in the Michelin star, star restaurant with the CRISPR cabbage on here. So then I was even making it better than they did over in the US. So, uh, and I can say the whole point doing this, that's of course to try to, as much as possible, because we knew some sooner or later, this will be the uh, authorities or EU will decide about this. So the more you can make the impression that this is an unstoppable process, it's already there. You need to take a decision now and plans are out there, the better. So I was also going to other countries, which was a lot of fun as well. Then I could ask, I was asked to go to Finland. Oh, could I bring the cabbage? Because then in Finland, they didn't know whether this was a GMO or not. So then they have to ask the Finnish authorities, the organizers of the meeting. They ended up saying, no, you cannot bring the cabbage. But well, perhaps if you only take the shoot, not the roots, because then they cannot propagate. So this is me at the airport in Umeå where I'm sort of leaving the pots with the, with the roots and then just bringing the shoots into Finland. That was okay for them. In Norway, they just had a new food policy taken by the parliament. And in that food policy, it reads in Norwegian that gene edited organisms must be regarded as GMOs and there must be guarantees that they are traceable, otherwise they are not able to be used. So then, of course, this is interesting for me because this is, of course, it's traceable for me because I know which gene has been deleted, but not for everyone else. <laughs> so then, of course, I have to bring this to Norway, but, uh, but these, the organizers, they say also like the Finnish because the people from the authorities would be in the audience, so they say, no, well, they don't, we don't want you to bring the cabbage as such. So then I thought, okay, I'm doing it as in uh, to Finland. I will take just a shoot, but then I will destroy it by eating when I pass the border into Norway. <laughs> but uh, 
during the flight, actually, I found well, it was much more fun because then I landed, and then before you go to the customs, then you're still international area. So then I was eating it there in the uh, in the Garde Moon Airport, and then this part doesn't taste so good. Then I threw it away here in the in the waste paper basket. Then of course someone has to need to take this and carry it into Norway for destruction. So then the question is, I mean, is did I commit the crime, or was it this guy who carried this in who was committing the crime, if there was a crime at all committed? Then Mickey contacted me whether I could come here to, Nor to Denmark for a, because you were to have a discussion. It was a meeting by the ministry <laughs> about this. And that made it easier for me because then I can communicate directly with the decision makers. So it was right over here in. in it was a public meeting, but organized by them. So then I could really ask, which I've been doing now for many other countries as well. This is a form of question. Can I bring a cabbage like in Sweden? Or can I just bring a shoot like to Finland? Or a chips like to Norway? But if you say no, what would you do if I do it? <laughs> because, the, of course, you can have laws and rules, but if you cannot enforce them. What's the problem? <laughs> Why should you do it? And my argument all the time has been that in our uh, sort of legal system, if a prosecutor cannot prove that the crime has been committed in the first place, there cannot be a trial at all. That's the first prerequisite for uh, someone getting into court. So if I, if I don't tell you what gene is missing here, I don't think the police can ever get forensic evidence that I have done this. First of all, which gene is missing, and secondly, that I, or rather the ones that I got it from, have done this on purpose, so that it's not just a uh, spontaneous mutation. So, and we were eagerly waiting for the decision for EU because it, we knew it should come. I was, this was, in fact, an EU meeting about food 2030 in Plovdiv, so this is the director general of uh, research and innovation. So there we were here and serving him some CRISPR cabbage, some other things to do this. It was quite an, I was an, I said disturbing experience to hear the people, these were EU officials and others talking about the future for agriculture in Europe. They said technology is important, we need to combat climate change. They talked about for this for a day and a half and they didn't even mention the word breeding. <laughs> because this is, a, it's a word that in, more or less in EU terminology, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's a dirty word more or less. It's very hard to say that this is what, how we should combat the future challenges. But anyway, so he was very nice. Obviously he told his son was working with CRISPR, but in the animal system, so he was really, he was up to date, although he's not a, uh, natural scientists, but anyway. But then, as you know, came the decision from the European Court of Justice about this French case, about the rapeseed, the herbicide-resistant rapeseed, that really implied that when this was a GMO, not the GMO one day in my garden, the next day the same plant was a GMO. And that makes a lot of change for all of us, including that I can bring it here because you can bring stuff from, non, from GMO plants throughout Europe, but you cannot market them. And this I've discussed with authorities a lot. So if I, probably if I would give one to you, this is not marketing, so then I would say, if I would give it out to you, then it would be market release. Then I will be, yeah, I don't think I will end up in jail, but anyway, I will commit the crime. So, and we know there were a lot of strong reactions, both in Sweden. I guess we saw this last week as well from European Academies of Sciences. So I think the scientific community is clearly saying this is something that needs to be changed and it needs to be done quickly. And then we just hope that the politicians will listen. And of course, people like me and others are trying to make a lot of other nice examples of what we can use this for. I just added this because I think it's so it's so interesting from the communication point of view. The Michele Morgante and the other grapevine uh, breeders or gene geneticists in Italy, 
they try to say to the Italian wine producers that, well, you know, because Italian wines, they are extremely well regulated. If you're going to make an Amarone, there are three kinds of grapes I think you can use. And if you make, make another, there is no other way. You cannot make these types of wines unless you stick to these varieties. So then if you have a problem with mildew infections, you cannot start crossing the resistant varieties to the uh, susceptible ones, because then you don't have Sangiovese anymore. So there is no way that you can make these all the variety of the Italian wines as a result of uh, traditional breeding. You could, of course, look for mutagenesis to find, because it's well known which is the yield. You can basically know the mutation that causes mildew resistance. But say that if we were able to introduce this into your Sangiovese by CRISPR, then you could still make the same wines if this would be regarded the same thing. So they are. They are not there yet, but they're well on their way. And that, at least according to Michele, really raised the eyebrows of the winemakers as well, because then they saw maybe there's something in it for us as, as well. But I will end by just saying a few words, because I think we should end soon, about what I think is a maybe as important, but much less discussed implication of the Swedish interpretation of this. And that is really that plants do not suffer from an ancestral sin. That means that an offspring of a GMO can be a not GMO. That's something that has been discussed in the community for quite some time. And uh, those that are against GMOs in general, they say, yeah, yeah, if you use gene technology, then it's bad, and then it's, a, but it's never been tested, at least to my knowledge before, uh, by an authority whether this is true or not, because there haven't been and no one has asked. But since this particular plant was a GMO, but the offspring of this was not a GMO, that actually is, I think, the first case where at least in Europe they said that it should be no problem to have transgenics in the process. This is, for instance, extremely important for us as working with trees, because our problem in breed, tree breeding is the generation time. So by introducing early flowering, we can overexpress FT, and then you can get flowering. It's a bit complicated to get it to work in practice, but in theory, you can slow, the, uh, slow down the generation time from 30 years to one year. And then if you can do the crossings and then segregate everything out at the end, that should not be a GMO. That's the implication of this. And uh, now we cannot do it with CRISPR for the time being in Europe, because then it will be a GMO and all. But I should put your attention to uh, another decision from the Swedish Board of Agriculture that came only this week. Because I uh, helped a group of uh, Dutch researchers to ask our authority about what they should do with cybrids. That is where you sort of re replace the, you can actually replace the chloroplast mitochondrial DNA in the same genetic background. So they published this paper now in January, that they have a whole series of cybrids where they have the nuclear and plastid and mitochondrial DNA have been swapped. And then they saw, that they saw effects on photosynthesis, and some of them a little bit, and some of them a little bit more. And they wanted to do field experiment on these ones. And then the question was, is this GMOs or not? The don't know so much about the technique, so don't ask me about that. But really what you do, you have an haploid inducer line, and then you have the wild type accession, and then if you cross this, these chromosomes are eliminated. So you will get a haploid uh, stage here, and then these go through diploidization. So then you end up with this one, so you only have, so if this was a father, you only have the nuclear chromosome from this, and if this was the uh, mother, it's only the chloroplast and, chlor and mitochondrial genome that gets there. So now the authorities said, if you do it like this, there is no transgene here. There was in the two generations back, but then it's not a GMO. And of course, cybrids are unlikely to save the world. <laughs> this is something that we use as a research tool. But exactly the same thing is what we are using in this reverse breeding technique, which really is that you start with a heterozygous individuals, and then you reduce 
variations. You make really homo fully homozygous lines out of uh, in one step. So it's the same thing. You are uh, you are really making. I mean, I can go into the details later. But you're making so these ones cannot be this chromosome cannot be transferred to the next generation. So this is what you do here as well. So then you can generate homozygous lines from heterozygous in one step, and then you can start crossing them, so that, which means that you can do F1 hybrids in a very short period. And this has been around, discussed for uh, several years, and this is a review a couple of years ago, where they said that this does not fall under the GMO legislation. But in Europe, that has not been clear yet, and there are companies that want to do, do this, and that have been prevent, they have been I decided not to do it because I was uncertain about the GMO status. But I think that this really means that oh, now, if since the Swedish authorities have interpreted the EU legislation, it probably means, or the implication should be that that should be in whole Europe. So now the Dutch researchers that first ask in Sweden, now they will go to their authorities and ask, okay, can we do the same in Holland? Because it's not the GMO in Sweden, Consequently, it should not be a GMO in Holland because it's the same regulation. So maybe this will open up something that may be of importance for guys like you as well that would like to do rapid domestication. But that's it. So thank you for you and, and you for attention. <laughs> thank you very much, Stefan. So questions? I can come with one. Was it? Uh, you had the first CRISPR cabbage mm -hmm. made here. Was it, was it also the last in your? <laughs> what, what is your feeling? Yeah? yeah, well, we don't work with cabbage. <laughs> so so we, we don't do any, any more cabbages. No, but it's, well, as you know, we have this absurd situation right now that outside of Europe, you can, uh, Last year there were some soybean var varieties around. This year there will be more. So, and in China and so on, there will be these things on the market. And Europe will need to stop them when they're getting over here. And we all know this will not work. So, yes, others will do cabbage, but not we. <laughs> more questions? Just a second. Thank you. Very nice talk. So um, I'm still very, you know, in China, it's, uh, this uh, uh, genome edit crops have to be regulated mm. so far. Mm. So then I'm very curious because uh, in, like, uh, in Sweden, in 2015, mm. you decided, you, the government decided you, this, those products will be not regulated. Mm. Then three years later in, Par in France, yeah. You know, in July. Yeah, because that was so overruling the Swedish Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I'm trying to ask if, then what happened? Like, uh, you hear this um, yeah. kind of umbrella yeah. already, but uh, can you just like in Sweden, you no, can just... We, we cannot do it in Sweden now. We then we have to apply for GMO permits if we're going to do this okay, CRISPR. Okay, yeah. So that happened, I mean, of course, for me in the garden to get the GMO permit, it it's time, takes time and costs money. Mm -hmm. But uh, the starch producers in, that are making this, uh, in the QB, that's making the starch potato with change amylose, so they did experiments without permit one year, and then they want to continue them. So then they ask for a GMO permit, and then they could do that. So then they could do the field experiments, but then under regulation. And the good thing with the authorities in Sweden, I said that several times, because they, I think they interpret the law as the authorities are supposed to do. They are making a scientific evaluation of whether this is safe or not. And if it's safe, then they give us the permit for a field experiment. They cannot decide about market release because that is up to the European level to do. Okay. But field experiments are it's decided easier. exclusively by the national authorities. Okay, but then let's talk about a field experiment, for example, because still you can calculate this uh, genome edited crops into you know, different groups. Like you talk so much yes, about the knockout. The, yeah, but the field experiments is for a given site at a given time. So okay. if you would like to do it somewhere else in Sweden. Someone else have to get the permit for that particular. They would get it, but it means another procedure which is 
relatively time consuming. We've been thinking of this, of course, whether you can do some more generic things. Mm -hmm. We have, for instance, asked, because I know here in Copenhagen, you developed some 15 years ago this little kit that was going into schools where you can look at GMOs, uh, this uh, check for biotech, whether that could be a permit also in Sweden that it could be in every school and so, but according to our forest, you cannot do it. You need to specify this space, one, two, three, four, five years. So, okay. hmm? yeah, thank you. So, Sergei Schiavella. Just to add a comment, or I think you can probably push for some compromise. That's what happened in Australia. Uh, I was the president of National Society of Plant Scientists and I was in my role sitting on the advisory board for government when they did gene regulation of legislation. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was done, the comments were submitted on behalf of Science Technology Australia. This is a big body which includes like 70 different societies. And so uh, it was clearly written that it's a tool and it's by itself, it's not GMO. It depends really what you do with that. Mm. And I live in the only state and country which has prohibition, Tasmania. We don't have the, um, we don't allow to grow GMOs in plants. And CRISPs transform plants were allowed to be grown, mm. which was a major blow to greens. But yeah, it's so the, the summary is it's really what you do with the technology rather than if you apply it, it's already automatically, you know, mm. guilty by association. So I think if you put or push legislation in Europe this way, you might be having more chances for success rather than black and white. So yeah. go mm -hmm. for shades of gray, mm -hmm. that's basically what I'm saying. Yeah. We managed to convince, and I, I could not believe myself because you know greens are very strong in Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, I should say this is a partly a consequence of the political situation that we have in Europe, that we have a EU that regulates some of the things, and we have uh, Nash, 27 Nash nations that sort of don't want EU to decide about everything. That's why we have this very particular situation that first you have a scientific evaluation and then it's the individual member states that has to vote with two thirds majority and so on. So there is not one single body that you can convince. That's the problem. You really need, and in the European Parliament, there are so many parties sitting there in different groups and so on. And so even though I think the EU Commission, I'm not sure, but I could imagine that they could realize that something needs to be done, but it doesn't help if they believe so, because they need to convince the majority in the European Parliament. So that's why I and others are spending time, because that's the downside with the democracy. If, <laughs> if people believe something is bad or wrong, then the politicians will probably go along with that. So in the long term, you need to change the whole population uh, perceptions of this. So in this case, Stephen, do the people think it's bad then? Because that's also, yeah. No, in general, I mean, there have been uh, asked the European public, they don't care and those who care who think it's very good. The problem is that in order to get there, we need to change the legislation. <laughs> and the legislation has not, since the, it's so polarized in Europe. So for 20 years, it's been the same. For 10 years, scientists have said we need to change it. But politicians said, well, it's, yeah, I mean, it's yeah, like in the US, you have two groups, they can they live in different worlds and they need to agree if they're gonna be a new law. And that's really what has been made so complicated. Hablo, Sheridan. Uh, I wonder what, what is the main driving force for, for anti-GMO in, in people. Um, when I teach, I teach genetics to, to third year students and when I come to a class when we talk about transgenics, plant transgenic plants, not animals, but just plants, they, what they complain is about uh, soybeans that use a lot of herbicides and, and probably they don't complain about anything else. So it looks like sometimes it mixes with anti-capitalism and so how, somehow those kind of mm -hmm. things. So, so what is the driving force against GMOs in, in Europe? No, that no I agree okay. much. It's, it's much more an anti-capitalism anti or anti-large scale agriculture movement and so on. And there is a lot of psychology within this as well. I mean, actually thinking about that yesterday as well. <laughs> now we are in this corona situation and we all know that when 
fear struck us. <laughs> then uh, rationality is going out. <laughs> and that's one of the main problems here as well, that one person say, uh, saying that this is dangerous in most people's mi mind way more than 10 people saying that it's not dangerous. And uh, this is, well, we can't do something about it, but it was established basically 20 years ago in the population of our age. This was a connection that was made, and you find it in popular culture, wherever. People know that GMOs are bad, <laughs> and they learned that when they were young, so then it won't change their mind. So it, uh, it is a long-term job. So, Henrik? Because the case is that classical GMO has not disappeared. It's basically, so the, the, the regulation actually created a monopoly. Hmm. It's a small handful of companies that, uh, so, and it's, I mean, I think soybean is 67% worldwide, it's GM. Uh, soya is also 60 something. Hmm. So, uh, so we have actually created a monopoly because it's so bloody expensive to get it approved. So that only a handful of people can mm. actually to manage it. I have tomorrow in unless everything drowns in Corona. I have a a, a discussion paper in that uh, a Danish journal called Elting about this. So you could uh, take a look on that if you <laughs> want. It's in Danish, but yeah. <laughs> has, uh, yes. So thank you. Some more questions. So so, so check it out. Mm. Uh, actually, we I think uh, Japan. You know, we all know Japan. They def they define GMO based on this process based, but uh, still, Japan is also a country. They, you know, they don't regulate uh, mm. genome edited mm. crops. So I think it's a very good example. Mm. You know, yeah. many countries like China mm. could really mm. learn from it. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm optimist since. Now, since there are countries that will not regulate them, that's why it will be around in, in five years, it will be everywhere. And then those like Europe that are resistant, they will face so much of a problem. So that will be the driver that will make change eventually. When also when European farmers will not have access to varieties that they will get outside, then money talks again. So this is what will think change, but it will take a few years. Thank you very much.